Hello, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session. Going to allow a little bit of time before I get started. Hopefully, everyone was able to get their lunch. Had a good break from your screens for a little bit, able to recharge. Got some great information in the morning, and hopefully, we can continue on with an enjoyable conversation this afternoon. And so I'm going to go ahead, start our Land Banking 101 conversation. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Larkin, and I serve as the director of the National Land Bank Network here at the Center for Community Progress. I've been in this role since January of 2021 and excited, excited to share with you all uh, some information about what land banks are, uh, give a, a bit of a background about kind of how land banks work as a tool. And maybe if you're thinking about, could a land bank be right for you, for your community? Hopefully this presentation today kind of explains what they are and some of the ins and outs of that. If you want to get into the additional information, there'll be more in the office hours later, but also my email address is here. And uh, please feel free to reach out directly to, to us. Um, the National Land Bank Network has started in 2020, and we serve the land banks throughout the country by helping to support and connect with them. So as was mentioned in the conversations earlier today, systemic vacancy is the issue that we're directly looking to address here. And uh, land banking is a tool of, once you have figured out how to Properly work with your uh, properly properly work with your code enforcement piece. Properly inform and correct your tax foreclosure system. Uh, you fit, you've gotten them to fix it up if they're going to. You're ready to give it up. Who is the responsible steward or owner that can take care of that property? And that is the opportunity where land banks come in. So what I want to do now is put a poll up uh, of the group right now to figure out who all resides in a community that has an active land bank. Uh, the reason we're asking this is because it'll help inform me in the conversation that we're having today about who all is here. I'm having a conversation about what a land bank is for someone who's not in a community or unaware is a little different than one who has a conception about the land bank in their community, but would like to know a little bit more about what it really is and what it does in that space. Looking at the poll, it looks like we're um, split pretty evenly uh, between those who reside in communities that have an active land bank versus those who do not. All right, we'll leave. Got about 80% of the individuals have responded here. So looks like we got a pretty decent breakdown. Um, about half of you are in a community with a land bank. And so uh, what we ask is, uh, what we ask is, what does it mean to have a land bank? The fact that I have a land bank, what does that mean for my community? What does that mean? What, is, what difference does it make? And what kind of, how should that look in the space here? So I'm gonna go ahead and, and talk through that. And so while I get started, while I get started, what I would like to, um, do is uh, get you to utilize the chat. So everyone can see me, but I can't really see all you, all of you out there. I recognize there, are, uh, based on this, the poll, there are about 180, 200 folks in and out moving through this here. So use this time right now to communicate in the chat. I'd like to see kind of what community you're located in. And if you know the name of your land bank, you can put that community. I will put in mine, Brian Larkin in Flint, Michigan. And I'm served by the Genesee Council. 
or if I didn't know it was that, I don't know. So if you go ahead and put that in the chat, just to get uh, a look at kind of who all is here interested in those conversations, and it'll help each other as well. So you guys can know who you're in here with right now, uh, who you're sitting in the session with and kind of what other individuals there are. So what is a land bank? Land bank is a public entity with unique powers to put vacant, abandoned, and deteriorated tax delinquent property, properties back to productive use according to community goals. The most important piece of this definition is not a public entity. The most important piece of this, this definition is not even unique powers. The most important piece of the definition of a land bank from our perspective at the Center for Community Progress are the last four words, according to community goals. The reason you have a land bank is not because, oh, well, our community needs to figure out a way to sell land, or even the city needs to figure out a way to bank land. No, we need to figure out a way to disrupt systemic vacancy by returning property to productive use. And we need a public entity that has some unique powers to help us get there, because what we're doing right now isn't fully accomplishing the goals. For communities where that stands right there makes sense, land banking is an amazing tool. So what is a land bank? A land bank is, is best in a situation where you have these specific problems. If your community has a large number of vacant, abandoned, deteriorated properties, land bank might be right for you. If you have fragmented inventories where, you know, you, you got a lot of vacant properties, but some of them are owned by the city, others are owned by public works, you got private industry, you got investors, you got all these different pieces kind of tied, some are tied up in the courts, and those pieces, a land bank could potentially help with that. We have properties with little market value, because think if you have large numbers of vacant property, but they can sell, they have a value, then you've got a solution to return it to productive use, the private market. But when they have little to no market value, a land bank may help in those cases to, to produce the, the type of outcomes we want for our communities. And when there are restrictive public property disposition requirements. Recall on the previous page, I said the most important piece of there was according to community goals. Sometimes the community goals may not be, let's sell this for the highest bid. The community goals may not necessarily be, let's turn this into the property that returns the best value, returns the highest dollar value, so we can operate our organization. Um, and oftentimes I would argue what we've seen in practice is it's usually not the highest, uh, highest financial return that determines what's the best use or what's the community use. So if that's the problem that land banks are built to address, what are some situations where land banks are not structured for? A land bank is not a simple community development corporation. You're just looking for, hey, we need to build housing. We need to create an organization to build more housing. We've got the inventory, we've got the plan. We don't have enough builders, or we don't have enough developers. Land bank is not by itself just a simple CDC. Land banks are not financial institutions in and of themselves. Uh, land banks, contrary to popular belief in many places, are not the place where you get rich quick. You look at the listing that a land bank has as properties to find your next gold mine. And one of my favorites, and if, if you all had the chance to hear me at that academy last year, it won't be your first time, but I really, I, I think this gets the point home too. Land banks are not Rumpelstiltskin. Who remembers the story of Rumpelstiltskin? The story of Rumpelstiltskin was the girl was trapped and needed to turn the straw into gold. She had nothing but something that didn't have much value at all. She needed to turn it into this immensely valuable thing so she could get her freedom. She had no way to do that. Rumpelstiltskin came and was able to turn that heap of straw, to turn those vacant, derelict properties into these amazing beacons of community vitality just by himself. There was, she didn't give Rumpelstiltskin, in, uh, she didn't give Rumpelstiltskin any subsidy. She didn't give Rumpelstiltskin any tax credits. He turned the straw into gold. Land banks do not function like that. And when your community believes that, oh no, we have these bad challenges, 
let's create a land bank and then we'll get the results on the end goal. You're setting everybody up for, fail for failure. That is an unrealistic um, expectation placed on the land bank. And then that results in a little bit of uh, frustration when there isn't a real uh, consensus on what the purpose is here, on what the purpose is of the organization and how these tools can realistically work. Because there are some amazing powers and I'm gonna get into them, but let's set a level field here on the first end. Land banks, the converse, if you are one of the 40% of people who responded to the poll that you do not have a land bank in your community, and the reason that you're listening to this today is because you're interested in understanding if a land bank makes sense, look on the left side of your screen. If that's the problems that you face, and you recognize the right side of the screen is not what you're looking for, then land banking may very well make sense for you. Another note, um, I'm gonna allow time to go through the Q&A at the end of the session, but please put them in as you go. As soon as those ideas pop in your head, please drop the formal questions in the Q&A. I want you to continue to use the chat to engage for conversations and ideas. If you have stories you wanna share, about your land banks, if you want to reinforce things that I'm saying, or if you want to fact check things that I'm saying, well, put that perspective in there, please use the chat. We learn best when we can learn in a collaborative set, set, setting. I recognize we're all in our individual spaces, but let's learn together, let's engage together. So if you have ideas and things you want to share, put that in the chat. If you have specific questions you want me to address, put it in the Q&A, do it all throughout the conversation so we can jump in there. The, the larger the Q&A gets, the, the quicker I'll jump through my session. So if you want me to talk less and go through the session more, ask more questions, but I'll work my way through regardless. So let's take a step back. Well, what's the evolution of land banks? Um, because when you look at it today, it seems like a thing that exists and kind of has always existed. But over the past 40 years, land banks have really made their mark, established themselves and moved, moved up to the forefront in a lot of the conversation here. These nimble, locally driven public entities are directing problem properties back to productive use. See that again, we're really harping on a lot of those same um, concepts. These locally driven entities are turning problem properties back into productive reuse. And a lot of those goals look like inclusive neighborhoods, resilient communities, and really helping to address head on the unjust practices that have led to the communities and dealing with the, not just the communities, but that have led to these concentrations of vacancy in a, in a lot of various spaces. So what does that evolution look like? So at the beginning, there were about four, there were four uh, municipalities across the country who had land banking programs this first generation of land banks. What this essentially meant is this is where the surplus property that was owned by Cleveland, City of Atlanta, Louisville, St. Louis, this is where their property was held. Property was held in this, these land banks. There were few and far in between. They engaged in various levels of work. They kind of worked, worked far, far beyond for, for those goals at that specific time. Much of the work of land banks that you'll hear about today starts after the formation. And so when we get to what we call, these are the first generation, when we get to the second generation, there was something that spurred a change. Why, why, were, why did land banks boom in popularity after this? What happened? Anybody who can recall what, what work was like in the, the aughts, the, the heyday of the aughts, we saw a huge boom in foreclosure. So what did that mean? As you guys went through um, our general counsel in that crisis session directly before mine, um, you saw what the individuals who are collecting taxes, your tax collectors in your communities, whether they're their trustees, whether they're commissioners, whether they're treasurers, they are the ones who are on the forefront of seeing what the community is stating the value is in their property. And what we saw um, nationally, around the middle of the 2000s was many people walking away from these properties. The treasures on the front line, the properties rolling back downhill towards them in ways that they had never seen before, in ways that were unprecedented. Um, 
And so they, they saw that coming down to them in ways that were unprecedented. However, prior to this, many of our hardest hit communities were already seeing this wave. The foreclosure crisis that bubbled to an eruption in the country began as a bubble, as began in earnest in many communities many years before, almost a full decade before. So you see in Michigan and Ohio, uh, the county treasurer in Genesee County, Michigan, specifically saw that a lot of these properties are coming back in waves that we didn't expect before. And before we had, they had a kind of a reformatted tax foreclosure system, what does that solution look like? How do we figure out a way to get these back in the hands? We have people who are living next door to um, overgrown grass, uh, to busted out windows, and they would like to do something about it. But if the systems that we have in place aren't reformed, once the systems that you have in place are reformed, figure out where they're gonna go. And so you saw a really big boom when individuals created a pipeline, a clear pipeline to their tax foreclosure system, communities created land banks. The big first wave in that second generation you saw in Michigan and Ohio. And to this day, Michigan and Ohio um, have some of the largest concentrations of land bank activities in the country. Then following suit, um, as people saw the successes in land banks like the Cuyahoga Land Bank, the Genesee County Land Bank, the Detroit Land Bank, states, states like New York, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Nebraska began to start up land banking activity of their own. So they moved forward with their own land banking activity as well. And we saw kind of what started as a few land banks here and there turning into an entire field of practitioners, an entire, entire field of practice. So we talked about what they are, the entities that they are. We talked about how they evolved over time, but what do they do? So delving into that, um, we mentioned this before, this is the, the problems that they help address. They do it through key activities and some of the most consistent activities across the board that you'll see a land bank engage in will be the acquisition of property, the maintenance of said property, and the disposition of property for strategic reuse. Those are kind of the core functions of land banks. Now you can look at many land banks across the country and see many different activities that are adjacent to that or in addition to. And generally they are reflective of the capacities of that specific organization and the needs of that community as a whole. When we're looking to address these problems over here, you need the ability to acquire property, to maintain the property and to dispose of it in a strategic way. And so what does that look like? Well, how did you get these properties in the first place? So we have a graphic here that was uh, property of the Center for Community Progress, where uh, the traditional pipeline of properties come from the tax foreclosure system. As you guys are all experts now, after sitting through, again, um, our general counsel's presentation on tax foreclosure, when you have a tax foreclosure system that um, has been reformed in a way to help support community residents, uh, you identify a property that's in private ownership. The first piece that you want uh, to happen with that property, fix it up. Code enforcement, as Libby laid out earlier today. Code enforcement is determined they're not going to fix it up. We have a reformed tax foreclosure system, though, where we can streamline this process and get it forward. Then there's the ability for property to be transferred to a land bank. The majority of property that exists in land banks comes from this pipeline. When you look at this pipeline of property, this is usually in your communities, again, for your the 40% of individuals who said they're in communities that do not have land banks. This pipeline is where you will see, um, that's where a land bank, when you're thinking about, does it make sense if I have a land bank or what would they be able to do? Where would the properties come from? This is your potential pipeline right here. And so again, Going from there, then properties are transferred to a land bank. In addition to that, outside of this tax foreclosure pipeline, you can have um, sources of inventory from donation, private purchase, property swaps, and other governmental transfers. I will say these activities support the strategic goals of the organization. The lifeblood oftentimes for the majority of land banks though is this 
the main pipeline of saying, look, these, this represents the large problems that we want to get our hands on and having access to. This also represents the place where our tools, which we'll get into, make it more advantageous. And then from there, from land bank ownership, transferring it to private ownership, to a property is sold to responsible end users who put the property back onto the tax rolls, consistent with community goals. And I'm going to keep harping on that point and to your tired of hearing me say it, but when you're taking these conversations back to your community, wh whether you're a community advocate who's working with an existing land bank, whether you're a land bank staff member who's engaging with the community as a whole, or whether you're an elected official who's trying to figure out how all this works together, the key piece that should inform strategies, activities, and work are a way to reflect alignment with community goals. So what are the powers of land banks? This list that you see on the, the screen here uh, is available through our land banks and land banking uh, publication. And I think resources that you have access to in this webinar and the others throughout the day will send links to different publications. But what I wanna say about this list of powers here and everything I'm gonna address today throughout the rest of the presentation is that this is not uh, a list of any particular land bank. So what I'm talking about today isn't, this is exactly what happens if the land bank in your community for the 50% of you who are in communities that have land banks. No, this is a list of the potential powers that land banks could have and the powers that land banks leverage to accomplish their goals. So some potential powers include the ability to acquire tax foreclosed property cost effectively, the ability to extinguish liens and clear titles, the ability to hold property tax exempt, the ability to generate and collect revenue from tax delinquent from delinquent tax fees, tax recapture, and other funding mechanisms. Uh, they also have the power to dispose of properties in ways that are flexible, driven not by highest price, but by best outcome. And they're also accountable to the public given their status as governmental entities. So how are these powers? So again, we think about what was the problem that, what's the problem that we're dealing with? Large, um, large inventories of VAG that are in this tax foreclosure pipeline, the majority of them. If I can get them cost effectively, hmm, recognize that right now this has no value in the private market or it has such a low value, negative value or something there, private market. But if I can get it cost effectively, I have, reduce the acquisition cost in that place. Also, another reason these problem, properties are so problematic is some of the people who would maybe want to work on them, maybe you're smaller developers or community residents, or the people who, who are invested in the community space. They're not looking at it as dollar signs. They're looking at it as home and community and space. They may want to turn it into something. If it's got tax liens on it, if the title is muddy, the work it would take to clear that and get that to work, Land bank bringing that, prop, that power to the conversation also reduces the cost, helps to open future opportunities, holding the property tax exempt, and as well generating uh, revenue as well from there in spaces. And so when we think about the powers of the land bank, these powers are only as valuable as one, the creativity and ability to use it, and two, the awareness in the community. What I say to communities all the time is if you exist in a community with a land bank, these powers listed here are the powers of your community, not just the powers of the organization, not just the powers of the executive director and staff who are there, but your community has the ability to do this. And because you have the ability to do this, let's start thinking more creatively about what are these end reuses? What are these community reuses that we want to create? having an entity who's charged with holding property tax exempt. Now, does that open up more opportunities for larger CDCs in partnership where the land bank is holding property for a series of time where they couldn't do it before? You know, We couldn't do this because it takes us 18 months to put together all the funding. And through that time, we'd still have to pay taxes because in our state, you know, the, our type of organization does that. You now have these new powers, but how do you engage in that? Communication, connecting, connecting with the land banks as well. Land banks are really need to engage with their community writ large. So where do these powers come from? 
states. Powers are outlined through state enabling or local legislation. Land banks are only as powerful and as flexible as the statute that creates them. So those powers that I listed on the other page come from various states. Um, the list here, as you see on this map, are the states with land bank enabling statutes. There are 18 states as of February of this year. Uh, when you think about where land banks are located, by and large, these states make up the majority of land banks throughout this, the uh, country. 340 land banks ex exist nationwide. 80% of them have been established since 2008, so that big boom that we saw um, that came after the work in Michigan and uh, around the time and following the great uh, foreclosure crisis. 84% of the land banks exist in one of these blue shaded states that you see here. The largest states, Michigan, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, Georgia, have the highest concentration of land banks in there. And uh, two thirds of the property that will exist in the inventory of land banks came through the tax foreclosure pipeline. So that's how all of these pieces are working together. Your state passes legislation to give an, an, or, an organization special powers to engage in the uh, tax foreclosure pipeline. And now they can go and get property in ways that typically weren't available before. And so um, this information as well, if you're interested in seeing exactly where all the land banks are, throughout the country. If you wanna look up your community and see if you're served by a land bank, our community progress land bank map is a resource available to you as well. So what are key elements of land banks? Um, land banks exist in cases where um, the only in entities that are dealing with our worst source properties are speculative, speculative markets. And so the purpose of creating a land bank is you have a responsible owner and end user who can help create more predictable outcomes that are consistent with the needs of your community. Finding a way to take these worst properties, if their goal is to take these worst of the worst properties and turn them into assets for community. Not the different, the distinction is the speculative investors are looking to take the worst of the worst properties and turn them into investment and uh, capital gains for the, the entity. The land bank as an organization is charged with taking the worst of worst properties and turning them into the benefits of the community. So how do they do that? Financial support is gonna be needed. If we're charging an organization to take these properties, even though we're providing tools, absolutely. The, the tools and powers, each state has different powers. So you're only as strong as, your powers are only as strong as the legislation that outlines it. But we're taking the worst of the worst properties using our powers that we have. So that helps makes it a little more affordable, but then trying to not focus on the land bank coming out financially the best possible in each transaction. The land bank sustaining itself on the transactions. Look, you got the property and now you sell the property and now you're a real estate agency. You can function off the surplus of what you sell it from. Well, if we're doing that and we're able to do it effectively, one, private market probably would have done it, or two, we're engaging in activity that does not align with the highest and best use of the community. We're trying to work in those spaces. We've got problem properties that are harming our communities, and we've got end results like affordable housing, green space, uh, public access, uh, small commercial, those are the things, supporting small neighborhood commercial districts, those are the things our community is needing to sustain that community fabric and to break that cycle of vacancy. And the land banks are charged to be in the middle of that, to help be the responsible, predictable steward that can bring all of these um, good, good actors, good intention actors together around accomplishing those goals. The only way to do that, financial support. And so as we get further along this conversation, we're going to talk about how land banks are funded. Um, but I really want, um, for the individuals who are part of the conversation today, who are representing uh, government, philanthropy, uh, financial institutions, land banks are engaged in work that um, by its definition was not designed to pencil out. They're engaged in creating these end goals that communities are investing in that public, 
that the public sector is supporting because it aligns with this larger mission. So that is the key core component of land banking. So let's think about again, what our land banks do. They're connected to the tax foreclosure process by and large. Remember I told you two thirds of the inventory that exists in land banks came from tax foreclosure. The reason that there's a little bit of logic to how that academy is structured. We're, we're working you through the, the problem property is making this way. It's made it onto the land bank. So you're connected to the tax foreclosure process. They're scaled in response to local land use goals and local community-wide goals, aligned with other blight abatement strategies like code enforcement and other pieces. They emphasize heavily, heavily community engagement. And they're policy-driven, transparent, and accountable transactions. That transparent piece is one that I haven't um, mentioned as much, but is a core component for successful land bank. I think what we say here is for land banks to be successful, because again, you're working in a unique space. You're working with land that already exists, that has a history behind it. You're working in a community that has existing relationships with public agencies and entities. And you're working with transactions in different spaces. If you are not transparent, um, it is very hard for land banks to generate the local support that is needed. It is challenging for land banks to make clear uh, where they're headed and is challenging to align partners and spaces. And um, those are the things that are needed to accomplish these larger goals. Land banks can't do it alone. Absolutely cannot do it alone. They are activating their powers to accomplish these goals in these unique set settings and communities and being transparent helps them to be a better partner. It helps the community can understand, oh, here are how you list in your properties. Here are the properties that are available. Here's the process for acquiring properties. Here's the clear steps that everyone is held to. This is, everyone is, this is how it goes to. And when there are exceptions, making it very clear on what the goals and priorities of the land, land use goals and community strategies are that as well. Let's talk a little bit about what land banks look like today. So by and large, land banks have a uh, median inventory of about 40 properties, but a mean or average of 1,800 properties. So what that says to us is that um, the majority of land banks are small. We've got some small organizations. We mentioned the phrase um, nimble in one of the previous slides here. Land banking activity, when we think about some of the most prominent examples of that, that I highlighted at the beginning, Michigan and Ohio, you see the, the largest land banks in the country by inventory are in Michigan, where you see tens of thousands of properties. When we think of land banking in the country, we think of these thousands of properties. But in actuality, the work by and large, by the majority of, of land banks, by the 340 land banks, are small organizations that are dealing with dozens of property, not tens of thousands of properties. Dozens of properties that are connected to clear communities that they have an understanding of who, who resides in these communities, what are the community challenges, what's the history and problems in the spaces, and what are the goals? What, what would they like, what would we like to see from this right now? Uh, so they're small organizations. They have dozens of properties, um, not necessarily the thousands. The, the outliers are some of your largest urban areas in the community that have the thousands of properties. And I would reckon the majority of um, land banks, the majority of communities who could establish a land bank that's going to have a potential pipeline in the tens of thousands have happened already. There are exceptions. Absolutely, I can think of communities that we've visited over um, the past several years that have land banking legislation that have you know potential vacancy of the tens of thousands. So there, there are still some, by and large, communities who are entering the conversation about land banking now, the majority of land bank communities are those who are trying to figure out ways to be nimble and flexible to deal with dozens of properties at a time. Where are most of the land bank properties located? Um, Again, the majority are in urban areas. And so we think about this popular perception of land banks of your Detroit's and your Cleveland's and your places. Yes, that's the majority, but not the overwhelming majority. 58% are in urban areas, but a quarter of land banks are in rural areas. A portion are in suburban and some are serving regional, statewide and other areas as well. So 
The reason this piece is important is that um, from the national perspective, when we're entering the conversation, land banking as a tool works in all place types. This is not an exclusive conversation for your urban area, not exclusive conversation for the rural area. Everyone has a way and tool in which if you have those challenges, large portions of vacant properties, fragmented ownership, and a desire to turn those into productive uses, land banking is a strategy that can work for you. So um, in, their, in their work, I mentioned kind of the key, the, the large scale buckets of what land banks do. I said that they acquire property, they keep up with it, and they dispose of property. Well, there's a lot more that happens in the interim of that and what that looks like. In their role, land banks' role to steward these properties that they bring into their ownership, yes, there's maintenance, and maintenance can have many types of activities from simply lot open lot maintenance and keeping grass from growing high, from introducing new seedling growing patterns, from incorporating to what happens at the end of demolition to for the future open spaces to maintaining existing structures, from boarding and securing it painting, place making, creativity. They're all different things that can go into the form of maintenance. But I will say maintenance is the one universal activity that we've seen in response. And uh, forgive me for, for not mentioning earlier, this data and information that I'm sharing from you at this point where you see the statistics are from our annual or biannual survey, state of land banking survey that the National Land Bank Networks puts out every other year. The most recent one, was circulated in 2023. The next one will be in 2025. If you're on this uh, conversation today and you work at a land bank or you're an affiliate associated with the land bank, please make sure you participate in our survey for 2025 because we want to accurately tell the story of the field of land banking and make sure that we're telling the story, we're incorporating the totality of what exists. But again, in their role to steward these properties, they're responsible for maintenance, figuring out vacant lot reuse strategies. Some land banks have utilized their inventory and their practices for job creation. Other communities that are working more in partnership with their county treasurer and looking at tax pipeline have moved upstream and worked with foreclosure prevention sources. I can think of examples in the state of Michigan where there is a direct close tie between the, trans the uh, tax delinquent pipeline and the growing inventory in the growing inventory in land banks, and then supporting future uh, development. So uh, when we think about what happens on reuse, one on the reuse of land bank inventory, one piece is reusing vacant lots and figuring out different ways to work in that open open use space. But the other one is the development development of structures. So uh, on exist on on existing structures inherited in there inherited. In on existing structures acquired by land banks, rehabilitation has uh, started to occur, new construction and towards the, the means of a creating affordable housing. One of the biggest uh, conversations or community desires that have been expressed to land bank leaders is how can we leverage your tools? How can we leverage your capacity towards the creation of affordable housing opportunities in our community? That's been a really, big piece of importance and thing that is really, really interested in there. Land banks are mission-based organizations operating in non-traditional real estate roles. Um, based on what I explained earlier, it should be no surprise that in our survey show that the vast majority were selling properties for, far le for less than fair market value. Um, again, uh, by, by creation of how land banks are meant to function. Um, land banks prioritize community residents as their number one recipient of property. When asked on the survey who uh, to prioritize, who are your um, top recipients of properties when you're selling properties, community residents were number one, local nonprofits were number two, and then local LLCs and private entities were number three. The reason this is important is a lot of the communities dealing with issues of that, especially in the, the past four to five years, because I'm we've seen by and large since the pandemic, market values are increasing. Market values are increasing throughout, uh, throughout the country in every market, even if so you have distressed markets to your, your higher end markets. But even in those, um, in those distressed markets, 
even in each market, you have your sub markets, each individual kind of area, what that looks like. So you still have instances of that, but when that properties are existing in areas, the market value is starting to creep up, you start opening the eyes for speculators. And one of the biggest concerns that we hear from the communities where land banks are served is how do we prevent land banks, from, how do we prevent this property from getting in the hand of outside investors? And that's the big, out of, outside, out of state, out of county, out of region, investors in areas, land banks prioritize in their community, the communities they serve, because they recognize putting those properties in the hands of local, local invested individuals helps break that cycle of systemic vacancy. But land banks, absolutely cannot do it alone. Um, just establishing a land bank and putting it up to run and um, hoping for the best is the rumble steel strategy. And we know that strategy does not work. Um, survey insights from our, insights received from our most recent survey have talked to us about the capacity of how land banks are function, uh, functioning. 37% of land banks say that they don't have adequate funding to cover basic expenses. And in fact, this number is probably the lowest it's been in recent years. The reason for that is a lot, a big uh, surge of one-time funds, one-time fund availability. So whether there's federal programming like the America, um, American Rescue Plan Act, or prior to that, the CARES Act or other different pieces that are coming in, people have a lot of funding right now related to things. The challenge for us at the National Land Bank Network and the Center for Community Progress is looking at the outstretch, how much of that is sustainable funding over time with people where um, there's investment in the goals of the organization, there's investment in the community as a whole, as opposed to right now we have enough funding and in three years, we'll be back to square one. 47% of land banks have a staff of one full-time equivalent or less. So remember when I talked about these flexible, nimble organizations, we're talking about 40 staff and one staff person. I mean, 40 property and one staff person. And uh, two thirds of land banks don't have the data sharing agreements with local government necessary to better understand their foreclosure pipeline. So why is that piece important? Let's think about it again. Take it back to the fact that we have vacant property that exists in certain areas in our community. I've got a pipeline coming down. I've got one full-time staff person or less than that who's working in other job and places. And they're required to strategically acquire property and connect it with end users and properties. With those local data sharing agreements, they can have a much better understanding of these are the areas, this is where property is located that we could potentially get our hands on. If you take that conversation, um, partner with the Peace for Transparency out to community, because remember the powers of the land bank don't just exist within the land bank, they exist within the community as a whole. So if the community now knows these are our powers, this is potentially the pipeline work, property that we can be working on. Your CDCs, your nonprofits, your block clubs, your community groups, your community garden spaces can better align with moving forward in that space, moving forward in a direction of raising funds, directing acquisition, encouraging, supporting, supporting land bank leaders and their board. And so when you're sharing data, when you're sharing that information, you're strengthening the power of the land bank, you're strengthening your community towards getting its goals. And so where do land banks get their funding? This is the question I'm asked more than any other question as the leader of a national network. And I can tell you each land bank is different and unique. This breakdown here was the results of the survey here. Um, one thing that you'll see that I just really wanna kind of highlight, the bottom is the real estate revenue being about a third. That's one of the most consistent things I could say there. So for the communities who are saying, you know, we wanna start a land bank and eventually in five years, it'll be able to fund itself. By and large, what we've seen is the funding from the funding that land banks receive can do about a third of the operations of what they need to really get that money back. In addition to that, more than a third is coming from government grants. Uh, in some cases, tax recapture, um, tax assessment fees, and different fee for service, foundation grants, in kind donations, and others. But this pie chart looks wildly different from one land bank to the next. So this pie chart here is not to say this is the model breakdown of an organization. This is the accumulation of the field as a whole. And we're all looking where all the dollars that are going in land banking. 
this does not necessarily reflect any one specific lambda. So key takeaways, a land bank is not a one size fits all tool, but instead an adaptable tool. Land bank is not a silver bullet towards your bad, bad problems, but a helpful one that must be in concert with other strategies. Land banks are most effective when working to address local priorities and their work is informed by community and neighborhood plans. Land bank achieves greater results through strong partnerships, a land bank can demystify or make itself more relatable and understandable through transparency. And a land bank with uh, public support can better focus on its mission. And so uh, as I get ready to get towards the end of the presentation, I just wanted to take a brief second to talk about the National Land Bank Network. Um, again, that I uh, over the network that supports all of these organizations across the country. It's really focused on a few key areas. Engagement, uh, we have 80 members who are part of this organization as of right now. Uh, membership is free. If you are on this call right now and you are part of a land bank and you're not sure whether or not you are a member, please reach out um, our, on our website. We have um, on the NLBN portion of the page, we have a sign up opportunity to join the National Land Bank Network. Membership is free. Uh, and we engage our members in a two-way street. This is not the land bank, the National Land Bank Network just telling you that we want to hear from you and kind of shape strategies around there. So technical assistance, connecting um, land banks who are interested in accomplishing specific goals, whether that's board training or uh, creating a strategic plan or revising their policies and strategies or connecting them with those pieces there. As I mentioned, we conduct a biannual survey, National State of Land Banking Survey. This is the first time this has ever been done and the only concentration of this information about land banks that exists anywhere in the country. The first one was in 2021, the second one is 2023 with the third one launching next year. Uh, every other year we do a network summit where we bring together individuals who are, who are from land banks who are connected Think of it as the, the NOBN wing of our, the land bank wing of the Reclaiming Vacant Properties Conference. And it's a great opportunity. Our first one was held in 20, the fall of 2023 in Cleveland, and we'll be announcing later this year where our fall 2025 summit will be. We'll love to see you out there. Anyone who is interested and cares about land banks is invited to attend. And um, we provide programming for our members this year. We've launched a mentorship program for new land bank leaders to be connected with more established leaders. We do a quarterly training session. The, the one um, coming up this month is focused on um, board, board training and board governance. We're conducting our learning exchange, our first ever rural learning exchange is happening this July, this summer as well. If you think about, um, we talked about the results of the survey. Results of the survey helped shape the, product, the strategies of the programming that the National Land Bank Network is doing. So we're really charging you to um, complete the survey if you're a part of a land bank or encourage your community to complete the survey as well. And so that is the, uh, the specific activities. The larger strategy is that land banks are better when they are connected, prepared, and well-resourced. So we can help connect land banks to each other, prepare them for the things that are coming along the way and help resource them. And we will see a stronger and healthier field. So now I will go into, okay, there's Tamara. Hi, we have a few minutes available for Q and A, but I strongly encourage everybody to attend our office hour, which will be directly following the end of this training. I'm going to start with the first question from, can a community redevelopment authority, a CRA, perform most of the functions of a conventional land bank? Uh, depends. Um, there are, if you're in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, your redevelopment authorities can, can actually receive the powers of land banks. But if you think about, uh, the best way to answer the question, if you think about the slide where I um, 
talk about the specific powers. My question to you is, can your redevelopment authority do these things? And if you're in a state that has legislation, look at the legislation, look at the power that they have there. How does it look here? The one thing, the, the one portion or area where I would usually say no is the ability to dispose of properties not um, to the highest price, have more flexibility in their disposition and um, the transparency around their activities. Because remember, the goal for this reuse is to really align with community goals. So on the whole, I usually would lean towards, hey, a land bank is uniquely different and can work really in great concert with the redevelopment authority. We have many amazing examples of redevelopment authorities and land banks working one in the same in places there. The piece that's most important to me, the one that I keep emphasizing here is, as long as you can align with community goals, as long as you can do disposition activities that align and uplift the community, then I see no, no, no reason not to. Uh, we have another great question here that might also work really well in our office hour, um, considering that it kind of encompasses things that were talked about in multiple sessions. With the Tyler ruling, can the land bank collect revenue from delinquent tax fees? Uh, I am not a lawyer and I'm not going to provide legal advice. What I will say regarding that is taking a step back, looking at the, the Tyler ruling and help me out, Tamara. Has this been discussed? Has Tyler yeah. been mentioned? Matt, okay. Yes, Matt. Matt did Matt did discuss the Tyler ruling. So um the impact is upstream of land banks. So if you remember this graphic about where the properties came from. Uh, if you look at this here, the impact of Tyler is at the tax foreclosure window. If you circle around here, tax foreclosure piece. Once we receive it as land banks, uh, we are, it's still being debated. But by in practice, we're receiving the property. The county is kind of on the hook for what happens in their space there. Once, once they're established a legally defendable foreclosure process, there shouldn't be much challenge in operating your land bank moving forward. The challenge right now is, what is that legally defendable process? So I don't know. So as it functions today, if you're in a community that has one, um, please uh, speak with your general counsel, look at your statewide counsel and kind of what that looks like and how that functions. But by and large, I do want land banks to know that the onus of the Tyler ruling is not explicitly on land bank activity, it's on that foreclosure process that then transfers it to us. And so because of that, many of the foreclosing entities are saying, hold on, let me figure out what this means for us. All right, perfect. We have, a, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Brian, do you have guidance for nonprofits that are trying to act like land banks in a state where there isn't land bank enabling legislation? Yes, I think the values that we talk about, about uplifting community, about engaging in spaces, about bringing all partners together who are invested in this challenge ring true throughout. So if you're working in specific communities and you need to have a, a clear understanding of who are the stakeholders here, who's invested in these outcomes, if we're working with, do we have affordable housing partners, do we have community land trusts, do we have these other pieces, let's bring those folks in there engage in that space. The one other bit of advice, the one um, reality of the space is you don't uniquely have any way to engage in the tax foreclosure process any different than any other CDC. And so when you're looking at the, when you're trying to act as a land bank, don't be holding yourself to some of these things because some of them don't actually apply to you. That this tax foreclosure pipeline, these special tools, these acquiring, these those different things of like, oh, well, have so for instance you may see a, a program that's rolled out for land banks where they're partnering with their cdc's to hold property for them or a deed and escrow program or quiet title pieces that's because they have special powers i wouldn't replicate any of those practices without those powers there i think you would kind of make it a little more challenging Thank you. We also have a question from Lori. So you mentioned, Brian, the Rural Learning Exchange Program, the Rural Land Bank Learning Exchange Program. Can you talk more about how you're seeing land banking used in rural areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Laurie, that's a, a really great question and one that's been uh, recurring. We're, we're seeing a growing interest in the field of really understanding what's going on there. So in a lot of rural communities, one of the initial conversations that come through are your challenges on your, your main streets. Do you think about kind of, you're going down that main street and you got three to four really problem properties that are holding back development throughout there. You've got investors or owners you can't get your hands on and it's preventing, causing a big drag. That's usually the number one piece I'm seeing in rural communities. But rural communities are not a monolith. We have rural communities that are creating multifamily affordable housing opportunities. And we have other rural communities that are doing widespread land assemblage to help support commercial or industrial opportunities. So it ranges by and large, but one of the common conversations it is, hey, on our main street, we've got these problem properties. How can we get our hands on them? All right, we have a couple of questions um, from folks who are generally asking how to start a land bank. So what are the general, what's the general process for getting a land bank started? Okay. So the first piece is going to the National Land Bank Network map, starting there first and foremost, identifying where you reside. So first question, do I reside in a state that has a has land bank enabling legislation? If yes, that gives you the rundown of how land banks are created. Your land bank and labeling legislation states what entities are allowed to authorize a land bank. Some of them say who should be on the board, how the activities work. It's kind of all laid out there. So you'll see in some scenarios where a land bank can be created by a for, by a tax collecting authority, foreclosing governmental unit, or a land bank can be created by a municipality in partnership with a board. Or, partnership with other pieces. So that'll be laid out explicitly how it occurs there. If you're in a state that does not have enabling legislation, some of the first steps is um, connecting with uh, the entities who are related to the challenge that is here. So the tax, the tax for foreclosing process. So your tax commissioners, your trustees, others, statewide associations, if the goal is to, to figuring out is your goal to start land, a land banking program, today engaging in the work or is the goal to pass legislation so our land bank can have these powers to do the work. If the goal is to create a land bank that has powers from legislation to do the work, then really um, a lot of that occurs from connecting on a, a coalition basis and kind of working with that. The As I showed you those 18 states, 17 of those the Center for Community Progress had a direct hand in assisting or directly writing that legislation and usually we are called into communities, not usually, completely, we are called into communities to help accomplish that and help to support that work. So if you're uh, creating a coalition that's interested in passing some state legislation, reaching out to the Center for Community Progress, but you have like-minded individuals and say, hey, how do we pass some legislation so we can do some land banking? That's a step there. And then again, if you wanna do land banking, pro part, um, land, a land bank programming type work, similar to the example I gave for the CDC earlier in there, focusing on the strategies of how can we amplify the voice of community, who owns the land, how do we partner in that space? Amazing. And with that, I think we are out of time for questions. I really appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for participating today. If you will not be joining us tomorrow, and this is the end of the road for you, please remember to to complete the post-event survey, which I just dropped in the chat. It'll help us a lot with continuing to improve the Academy. For the rest of us, let's end our day at the office hour with all of the rest of our, with all of the rest of our instructors. I will see you there in just a second. Thank you everybody. Please bring all of your questions.